Hey there ceramic students, welcome to my home studio space. Um, this will be uh, the place where I'm recording the majority of my tutorial work from and uh, you'll follow along uh, in your own personal studios. So I want to cover a couple things in this uh, introductory tutorial. A um, couple things about maybe uh, where I'm working and a couple of important things I've set up that are particularly useful uh, for a home studio space. Um, things that are sort of good for general studio uh, or workshop environments, um, but definitely a couple of specifics for the kind of work we're doing this semester uh, with both ceramic clays, oil clays, soapstone, uh, sort of dusty, dirty materials. Uh, I also want to go through uh, your kits and kind of inventory them, make sure that you have everything that's in there, um, show you a few things that uh, you'll have to find on your own, uh, and then encourage you to, um, to sort of uh, make and modify tools throughout the semester. At the very end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, actually assembling our wear boards. And so if you didn't get a chance to put this together at school, um, I've got that at the end of the video. You can just jump ahead if that's what you're here for. So first off, um, setting up a home studio will be absolutely critical uh, to be successful this semester. Um, since I'm only seeing you every other day or so, maybe even less, um, uh, expect to be doing uh, quite a bit of work every day uh, in your home studio for ceramics class plus um, maybe about an hour of homework per week or so that you'll be doing in your home studio. Uh, so a couple things that I want you to be particularly mindful of and this goes for just about all studio spaces that you'll need um, workshop studio spaces. Uh, try to keep it as clean as you can. Um, I've done my best, I'm going to be teaching a few courses this semester, I've done my best to sort of clear out all the projects I'm not working on, all the tools I'm not using, um, because just like uh, a classroom space or maybe a, a library space where you're doing your homework uh, for other academic courses, a studio, um, a cluttered studio, is not a good place to study, not a good place to work. Uh, and so a little bit of elbow room, a nice flat space is great. Um, if you can, uh, if you can find yourself a bit of an industrial space, uh, this is uh, sort of like a plastic cutting mat on top of a sheet of three quarter inch plywood so that if I spill or break or burn or whatever, anything, um, I'm not ruining anybody's day. Uh, if you choose to work in, say, like a kitchen environment, that's um, got a couple of problems. One is generally people spend money on, you know, their countertops or their kitchen tables, and you're going to mess that up with your ceramic work. Um, probably worse than that even, though, is that some of the materials we're working with, you really want to be careful not to ingest. Uh, and so if you're working with clay and you have food right next door, um, that's a no-no, right? You don't want to get the clay in your body, and if you're working where you're eating, that's a really kind of easy way to make that happen. Um... You want to maybe have uh, access to some good lighting, okay? Like I've set up my studio with uh, some good overhead lighting and some good low lighting too, so that um, even though I'm working in the middle of the night, oftentimes um, I can see what I'm doing and film what I'm doing. And in your guys' case, photograph what you're doing. Uh, your photographs of your process works are going to be how I see um, how I see what's going on in your home studio. Now, a couple of other things that are maybe uh, particular to ceramics um, is that you're going to have to have access to uh, some sort of water source. Um, and the, uh, the sink or sinks or whatever that you choose, uh, you want to be kind of careful with that, right? In my studio, I actually have access to what's called a slop sink or a shop sink. Um, but just because it looks kind of industrial doesn't mean I'm going to go dumping clay down the drain. Actually, underneath the sink, if I check out that drain, it's just got our domestic um, kind of an S-trap. Uh, which is only good at catching big heavy things like oops I dropped my ring down the drain it's not good for catching clay or like big gobs of mud and so um, you'll see, you'll oftentimes see me um, have like a bucket of warm water close by so that I can pre-rinse my hands and then dry off with a towel before I say touch my computer or uh, before I go to the sink and do a final wash up. Um, that way all the big chunks of clay, if we happen to get there, uh, get left in the bucket and can be easily thrown outside rather than going down the drain. Uh, clay is a lot like sand. It's clumps of silica and alumina particles and they're very heavy so they'll sink to the bottom of your sewer drains and continue to clog it up and clog it up and clog it up and before long um, you'll run into a problem. At school you'll notice they have these big traps about as big as this bucket mounted underneath every sink that catch all that sediment before it gets flushed into the sewer. 
Last thing I'll say that's sort of specific in your studio space that I want you to be really mindful of, and this is partially for your own health and also for the respect of, you know, everybody else who you share your home with, is that clay can be very dusty, particularly during certain stages of its life cycle, right? Um, as it dries out, it hits this point called um, greenware or bone dry clay. It's essentially dried up caked mud. Think of that desert mud, right, where a wind would kick up and blow dust everywhere. Um, that kind of dust is... Uh, is very very fine similar to maybe if you guys work at a construction site like drywall dust and not only will it get all over you all over your workspace um, but it can get up into the air especially if you're doing something like sanding your clay or scraping or carving it I'm not gonna have you do that but uh, you might be tempted to or maybe accidentally drop a piece that you've got um, it's gonna send that dust everywhere uh, so we're going to do things in our studio that mitigates that, um, but in your home studio, uh, the best way to avoid the dusty stuff is to just not work on your clay when it's in that dried stage. Uh, that's either um, a finished piece or that piece is ready to be fired, and once it's fired, it's ceramic. It won't be dusty any longer. With that, let's actually crack open our kits and take a close look at what's inside. Um, we have access to a big studio space at school loaded with tools, um, but all the tools at school are shared, right? This kit is yours, which means at the end of the semester you take it home. Uh, and you keep it. Uh, that's kind of a cool thing. Um, one of the great things about a small kit like this is that um, I'm going to kind of lay out some of the basic tools, uh, but they always point to something else. They to, uh, point to sort of a bigger or broader application, or they kind of get you started for making or modifying your own tools. So uh, first things first, um, these wear boards, uh, we made them at school. If you didn't get a chance to make it, skip ahead to the end of the video and I'll talk about how we laminated um, uh, a piece of plywood, a piece of gypsum board or drywall, and we wrapped um, wrapped a piece of duck canvas around the outside. Wear boards are really great. They allow you to move your work around without having to touch the work. They're also an absorbent surface, uh, so a couple things happen, right? The clay doesn't stick to it. Ceramic clays don't stick to it. And um, it actually will slowly pull moisture out of the clay and, and give us some control over the drying speeds. Uh, if you're working in a really dry environment, in an environment with forced air heating or something like that, our clays are going to dry out very rapidly. And so we'll use a, um, a couple of different techniques to slow that dry time down. Uh, the drywall board does a really great job of that. Uh, if, you, uh, if you get excited about this idea and you want to work on something larger, uh, occasionally you'll see me in my videos working on larger canvas surfaces. Um, in the studios at school we make these all the way up to uh, about 2 by 4 feet or so uh, large canvas surfaces to work on. Now the other stuff in your kit, uh, I'll just sort of break it down like this. You've got a wooden plank that we'll use um, as a standard for a sculpture. You have two lengths of aluminum uh, sculpture wire. One of them is a little bit thicker, one of them is a little thinner. Uh, we're going to use that as armature wire for building some figure sculpting. Now some of you guys who went home with clay kits um, early, you actually got some oil clay. Uh, the rest of us will get it later. Uh, I've got a variety of different colors of this stuff. I'll likely be using this brown oil clay. Now this is very different than uh, the ceramic clay that we use. This never dries out, and um, it's actually going to allow us to work and rework and rework and rework for a few days on the same piece without having to kind of frustratingly work on dry times. Uh, the one bummer about oil clay, though, is that it's, it's not exactly a final material. It's a modeling material. It never hardens. Uh, you can't fire it, and so it's really great for studies, but um, as a finished piece, it always kind of retains a little bit of a waxy uh, feel to it. Uh, also in your kit, you've got a couple pounds of our ceramic clay. The, the clay that we use is um, uh, a sort of a Dutch porcelain stoneware. Uh, it's, it's a very white clay body. Uh, it fires all the way up to um, high fire temperatures, about 2,000 degrees or so, uh, 2,100 degrees, or what's called a cone 5, cone 6 firing, and has um, a very glassy-like finish when it's done. Uh, uh, it's a really great clay uh, to do all sorts of work with, everything from sculpting to throwing on the wheel uh, to jewelry making. So we'll be dabbling in each one of those this semester. And uh, now we've got sort of a spattering of uh, small tools in here as well that we'll sort of walk through. Um, you have uh, an X-Acto blade, which we will use uh, for a whole bunch of different things, um, uh, not just cutting clay materials, but also cutting uh, boards. Uh, you've got a sponge, which we'll use to smooth and shape the clay. You have a utility brush that we will use for um, doing slip work. Hiding in your kit 
you have a needle tool. Now your needle tool may have a little guide here on the end. Uh, that's probably not gonna do you a whole lot of good. Uh, the needle tools are sharp, so watch the tips. Uh, they're not quite as sharp as your X-Acto blades, uh, but your X-Acto blades come with a uh, plastic sheath on the outside. Now we will have use uh, for both very, very sharp blades and dull blades, so don't ever throw uh, an X-Acto blade away. You also have a small kit of modeling tools. In your modeling tool uh, kit, you've got uh, what's called a spout making tool. This is sort of a, a tapered end tool. We're actually going to use that to um, make some stone instruments this semester. You've got a couple of small modeling tools, and I like uh, buying wooden modeling tools, uh, particularly because they're so easy to modify uh, with your X-Acto blade and a little bit of sandpaper um, if you don't quite like the way these are shaped or if maybe they weren't quite shaped right right out of the factory um, very very easy to modify and then you also have a loop tool uh, these are sort of rounded um, uh, steel stainless steel wires uh, that will allow us to sort of gouge and shape the clay very very handy uh, we also uh, have in the studio what are called ribbon tools which instead of being a round wire uh, it's sort of a flat blade um, that can also be a really handy tool as well totally worth um, worth adding to your kit down the road if you really like this stuff in the kit you've also got some spare blades uh, for the exacto knife uh, a second ago I mentioned sandpaper uh, we've got three different grits of sandpaper in your kit uh, should be a 120 a 220 and a 400 grit uh, you could sort of think of that as uh, rough medium and fine or rough medium and polish Now most of you guys probably uh, don't have your fettling knives in your kit yet, but eventually we'll get a fettling knife in your kit. Um, it's essentially a, a dulled out knife, a little bit pointier than a butter knife, uh, but we use them for all sorts of things. Um, if you uh, didn't have a, don't have a, a fettling knife in your kit just yet, uh, for years I honestly just used a dulled out steak knife, and I still use this. I still prefer this steak knife to uh, the store bought fettling knives. Um, just take the edge off of it with some sandpaper. Uh, clay cuts a little bit easier. Than all those other materials and uh, I just sort of like the heft of that knife a bit better. You also have um, a wire tool that we'll use to cut the clay. Uh, I broke mine shortly after opening it up, so I just shortened it down to a little bit easier length for me to use. Uh, you'll notice that I'm fairly regularly modifying the tools that I get from the store. Um, I think that's a, that's a good habit to get into as an artist. Um, I, we've got a, uh, a caliper in your kit. Now the calipers I purchased from a foundry overseas and they came back pretty rough. So if yours still has some rough edges after I uh, deburred them, uh, that's easy enough to use a piece of sandpaper and just rough off those edges so that they don't catch your fingers. We use that for measuring our sculpture. You have um, a whole spattering of uh, maple wood popsicle sticks and stir sticks. Now, uh, as mentioned earlier about making our own tools, popsicle sticks make for really great tools because they're kind of a hardwood and reasonably easy to shape with an X-Acto knife and some sandpaper. Uh, but we'll also be using them specifically to make fipple sticks uh, for a project later on the semester where we meet, where we need a very kind of specifically sized wooden chisel, uh, or two or three of them actually, uh, to make the airway of our stone flutes. should have a couple of binder clips in your kit. Uh, the binder clips are for helping to clip up uh, the plastic sheeting. I've got a couple of pieces of plastic sheeting included. One of them is loose. One of them it's actually wrapped around your clay. Uh, it keeps that clay wet, so keep it wrapped up for now. The smaller piece uh, works really, really well for kind of creating uh, a damp box seal uh, inside your plastic bin and around your canvas board, uh, but it could also be cut up and used uh, to sort of custom fit around works, and the clips sort of help bind it together. We've got a tool that uh, I've sort of modified for each of you. Uh, it's a uh, combination scoring rib and smoothing rib. These are sort of thin stainless steel sheets of metal that are gonna allow us to do sort of intricate work. If it has a little bit of a sharp edge on it, go ahead and sort of knock that off with the sandpaper. And then finally, most of you guys uh, should have a piece of sort of cardboard or, um, or mat board in your kit. It's a little bit thinner than cardboard and allow us to do some template making. The last thing you should find in your art kits is a small block of soapstone. The soapstone feels almost slippery. Uh, it's a very high talc stone and we're going to use it for some, uh, some basic stone carving this semester. Uh, it's pretty fragile, so set that aside outside of your art kit. If you have a shelf somewhere, uh, it's a good idea to keep that out of the way. Uh, if you drop that on a concrete floor, it would just explode into a thousand pieces. 
And so that may seem actually like quite a bit of stuff, and it is actually. I mean, that, that'll keep us busy all semester, but um, there are actually a few things that uh, I didn't put in your kit that I feel like you probably have around your house, or if you don't, they're reasonably inexpensive to buy uh, that you very likely will need this semester. So I'll talk about those for a second. Um, you're going to have to find um, some sort of spray bottle uh, to work with in the house. Um, something like an old bottle of Windex or spray cleaner. Clean out all the detergent that was in it and just replace it with water. Uh, that is, um, if you've got one that atomizes and sort of makes really small droplets of water, that's perfect. We're going to use that to sort of spray down our clay occasionally. That way it'll keep it hydrated if we need to let it sit for a day or two without touching it. Now also, um, if, uh, if you're working in a place like school uh, where you know, you're know you going to work afterwards or something like that, you might want to protect your clothes. Um, now depending on how big of a project we're working on, you probably won't need a smock or an apron, uh, but if we get into working on something larger, uh, you might occasionally see me throw on uh, a work shirt or I even wear a full body apron when we're sitting in a potter's wheel. I have a pair of potter's chaps that go all the way down to my ankles. Um, it just sort of keeps me from getting all slopped up. There's nothing particularly bad about getting clay on you. Um, it's just dried mud. It will wash right out, but all day long you'll kind of have a chalky mark on you. And depending on how big of a mess you are, it'll go on really wet, dry, and it's pretty obvious. Uh, something you'll also need, I mean, I'll provide all the paper toweling you need at school, but paper toweling doesn't go very far when you're really getting your hands wet. Uh, and so an old towel um, is really handy. Uh, you'll see me kind of reach down into my bucket of water, uh, wash off some clay, quickly dry my hands and modify and, and do some work on my computer. Uh, it's a bit of a strange problem to have to be working on a computer and clay at the same time. Uh, so a towel is going to help us sort of streamline that kind of washing and drying your hands constantly. You're also going to need a couple of small plastic containers. Um, one of the things that we'll be doing this semester is liquefying some clay and uh, using it almost like glue. And so you'll need a container that has a screw-on lid or a snap-on lid. Um, you know, something like an old ice cream container or a, or a yogurt container or something like that works great. Um, and also a small dish of, uh, of water. And those could be just be small containers uh, from the recycling and that's just fine. Now you'll also notice fairly regularly that I may reach for tools that you guys don't have access to. Um, I said earlier that I sort of have been collecting tools and working as a potter for a long time and I find often that, you know, making my own tools is a much better way to go than buying tools. I just can't find tools of a very high quality. Um, and so I'm also looking for tools maybe that um, have really interesting effects and so I, I make them all the time. Uh, this kit is, uh, is you know, what I've been doing, uh, what I've been working out of for something like 15 or 20 years. And so uh, every time I start a new project, I'm oftentimes making or modifying a tool and it just gets thrown into my box. Um, I'll describe that sort of as we go this semester. If you guys have some basic uh, woodworking or metalworking skills and would like to modify some tools or make some tools, I think that's a great idea. At this point in the tutorial, um, I'm going to actually walk through the process of putting together one of these canvas boards. Um, if you've already done that in class, that's awesome. Hey, um, I'll catch up with you guys in the studio or with the next tutorial and we'll actually get our hands dirty. Okay, so whether you're working at home or maybe at one of the large school studios, you'll find that um, these wear boards are really handy to be working on. Um, some of them are a single thickness of plywood that has had sort of a, a heavy duck canvas stapled to the back. Uh, the ones that we're going to use are actually a three layer board that has um, a layer of mold resistant drywall or sheetrock and uh, a layer of plywood for strength and it'll kind of stop the stop the drywall from cracking and then a nice thick layer of canvas or like a cotton duck canvas. Um, getting it all to assemble correctly is going to require a couple of tools that you don't have in your kit. Uh, so we'll probably do this job at school, uh, but in case you're just trying to do some of your own work at home, uh, something like a, um, a staple gun that shoots these sort of larger industrial staples, right? Um, these ones are probably a little bit overkill for the job. They're a little bit too long. I think I'll switch them out for uh, some quarter inch staples just because I'm only going through one or two layers of canvas into um, sort of a thin piece of plywood. Uh, flat 
flathead screwdriver and a needle nose pliers just in case you goof up and you need to pull out one of those staples. And then it's really handy to have a scissors uh, to snip off any extra canvas that might be um, kind of binding up in the corners. Your um, the, the plywood that I've given you and the drywall uh, that I've got. Now I just kind of rough cut these things down. They should be pretty close to exactly the same size, but just in case, you know, the edge of your drywall is really rough uh, or actually, you know, as you kind of line them up along the edges, if the drywall is a little proud, if it's a little bit too big, you'll have to do um, minimally, maybe uh, grab a sanding sponge and just kind of rough off uh, some of those ending, uh, some of those bits. If it's really bad, if it's, you know, if it's a quarter inch or something like that, like a tiny little bit of overhang is not a big deal, but uh, if it's really bad, uh, we'll just lay it down on one of the work surfaces that we've got, uh, extend the blade on one of these uh, snap knives, and, uh, and just kind of make three or four or five passes on the end. Uh, now, whenever you sand or cut sheetrock, um, now this is like a, a gypsum, uh, gypsum board, right? You're going to produce a really fine white powdery dust. Uh, not great to, uh, to get in your lungs, not great to sort of have spread around the studio. So do your best to do that kind of thing over a trash can or be careful to uh, wipe up after yourselves. Make sure uh, that you go green side up. Uh, in other words, uh, this will be the surface that you're working on and the canvas will sort of lay on top here. So the, uh, the sort of sequence or the stack, the sandwich stack that we're going to work with here is plywood on the bottom, uh, sheetrock or drywall in the middle, and then the, uh, the canvas on top. Make sure there are no crumbs or, uh, or nasty bits of uh, schmoo on the canvas there. Make sure you got a nice clean sheet of drywall here. If you go to the trouble of sort of stapling this all together only to find out that you, you know, have a loose staple or something underneath, that'll bug you all semester long. You want a, a nice flat surface here. Lay that, and it should be sort of mostly centered at this point. It's not uh, precision work here, but essentially we're going to roll the canvas over the edges and then use a staple gun to sort of drive a staple into each edge. Uh, if you do one staple in the sort of center of each piece, that centers the canvas and prevents you from accidentally sort of walking to the point where you don't actually have enough to pull it up over the edge. So I said earlier that I was going to swap the staples out. You see the sort of a difference in staple length here. I really don't need these long throw staples. We're going into a fairly thin piece of plywood. We're going through fairly thin layers. Uh, if all you've got is the thick stuff, that's great, but we happen to have a few different uh, lengths to choose from. So load up the correct size into your staple gun and then drive in as flushly as you can and as close to the edge of the canvas as you can a staple on each edge. I'm going to flip this around, pull just a little bit of tension into the canvas, and then uh, hold that tension down with two fingers, and then drive a staple sort of down right into the edge here. Now's a good time to do a couple things. Flip this thing over, double check it one last time. If you, oops, missed a spot, there's a staple under there or a piece of, you know, uh, junk from the studio. Uh, time to pull these staples out. One of the ways you can do that, right, is to get a flathead screwdriver under there and kind of pry it up or kind of grab the edge. Now, one of the things about these staples is when they go into the plywood, it's not like a paper staple. It doesn't just go straight in. It actually kind of fires itself out into sort of angles. And so uh, they can be a little bit difficult to get out. That's the point. There's, you know, essentially we're upholstering the, the fabric around the edge of this thing. Um, but it's worth doing it right here in this case. Now on such a small wear board we probably don't need too many staples in the back here. I would say I'm going to kind of maybe put one in on either side here to get a little close to the corners and then I'll come back and show you how to fold up a nice clean hospital corner. Okay, no need to, uh, to get too overkill here as long as I got a nice fl clean flat surface. Now I'm going to focus on these corners. Um, I don't want a real mess here. I would like it if my wear board could sort of sit reasonably flat on the table. So what I'm going to do is pull the corner as tight as I can. This is my last opportunity to sort of take any loose material out here and roll that fold over at, you know, something like a 45 degree angle and then try to lay the bunching on the back here as flat as I can. Now, because there's a lot of material here, I'm going through one, two, three layers of canvas. I may actually need a couple of, uh, a couple of staples to make sure that I hold that flap down. So 
So what we're going for here is a fairly clean corner that lays pretty flat on the surface of the table. If you have a lot of extra canvas here, this is your opportunity, right, that you could sort of nip some of that off. I'm going to staple all the corners down before I do any cutting. So if your canvas board sits pretty flat on the table, that's pretty much it. You don't need to go too much further. If uh, if you've got some real kind of like high flying, sort of piled up canvas areas here, now is not a bad opportunity to, to jump in and maybe lay some of that down. If you really don't like how the how the canvas is laying, uh, you could always shoot a little bit more, shoot another staple in to sort of tie it down. Uh, it doesn't need to be pretty uh, as long as it sort of does its basic job This is just a, sort of a work support or a way to carry your work around sometimes if um, if you don't want to have to uh, To touch your actual piece you can transport it using the wear board So uh, Ideally uh, you sort of know you've done it right if you can fit your uh, fit your bin right down on top 